My name is Nick Rennie. I'm the Associate uh, Director of the uh, Center for Southeast Asian Studies. Um, and my only function here is to introduce our speaker, um, uh, Ardes Tung Mong. Um, she is on the uh, Political Sciences faculty at uh, University of Massachusetts at Lowell. Uh, she holds a PhD from that institution. She's taught in such diverse places as uh, British Columbia and Australia. Um, in addition to America, um, and has written a bunch of really interesting things uh, just from the titles. Uh, Beyond the Teak Curtain, The Karen Revolution, Beyond Armed Resistance. She's going to talk to us about uh, uh, the social and political implications of uh, daily life of ordinary people. Um, and uh, with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to her. Well, thank you so much, Nick, for the introduction. Um, thank you again for um, allowing me to come here and to share with you my current research project in Burma. Um, I'm very honored and excited to be here. My research uh, looks at strategies by ordinary citizens in Myanmar, Burma, and um, their varied and collective impacts on environment, collective welfare, state capacity, and democratic practices. So in terms of methodology, uh, the research was carried out in the summer of 19, uh, in the summer of 2008, 2009, 2010, and the whole year in 2000, 2011. And uh, so I thought that I completed my research. Uh, Basically, I look at how ordinary people use different strategies to cope with their lives. But um, as uh, most of you be, uh, are aware of, uh, currently, uh, the Burmese government has introduced a series of political economic reforms. So I have decided to go back this summer uh, to look at how these uh, political and economic reforms have an impact on coping strategies of the ordinary people in Burma. Um, I use, um, basically my research is a qualitative uh, uh, method base. Uh, I use in-depth interviews, survey, uh, focus group discussion, uh, non-participating observation, and secondary resources, uh, meaning analysis of uh, Burmese language, local newspapers, and journals. And I was able to inter interview about 200 people uh, from all walks of life. Um, and my focus is mainly on individuals who make $100 uh, US dollars per month. Uh, I was also able to interview um, policy makers, uh, academics, uh, community leaders, um, and humanitarian um, uh, workers and staffs. My unit of analysis is individuals, households, and village. So before I talk about the coping strategies in Burma, I want to give you a very brief background of the country. Uh, Burma is in Southeast Asia, and it's currently grouped under uh, the category of low human development. And this is, it ranks uh, 149 out of 187 countries in the UN Human Development Index. Uh, per capita income is 1,535 US dollars. This is UN Human Development Index. But for some uh, data, this is uh, it's lower than that. And according to the United Nations Development Program in Burma, 26% uh, of the Burmese populations are still living in poverty. That means that they are uh, earning a dollar uh, per day. Burma has been ruled by the military government since 1962. And uh, since uh, 2010, however, uh, we have a newly uh, elected government. They are composed predominantly of ex-military officers and members of pro-military government party. 
Um, however, to many surprise, uh, the current government has begun embarking on a series of political economic reforms. And a few examples of these include the release of political prisoners, including the uh, main opposition uh, political leader, uh, Aung San Suu Kyi, who successfully competed in the um, uh, midterm elections and is now elected member of uh, parliament in the lower uh, parliament. And um, the government also uh, negotiated ceasefire uh, agreements with uh, many ethnic armed resistant organizations. Uh, it, it also tried to um, eliminate uh, monopolies, privileges uh, given to previous uh, cronies and military officers, uh, privatization of state enterprises, uh, relaxation of control over media, legalization of rights to workers union and strike, and provision of the right provision of incentive and monitoring mechanism to reduce corruption. Geographically, uh, Burma is divided into three distinct areas, uh, the south, the coastal area in the southeast and the southwest, the dry zone in central Burma, and mountainous area in northeast and northwest. And the country is uh, uh, very diverse in terms of the populations. Uh, the majority of the people um, are uh, Burma or Burman, uh, and they constitute 65% of the populations. And the rest of uh, them are um, uh, those who speak uh, minority dialects. And uh, there are about over 100 uh, dialects spoken in uh, Burma. So coping strategies uh, developed by ordinary citizens in Burma vary depending on where they are, depending on the environment, uh, the location, depending on gender, ethnicity. However, um, and when I did my research, I tried to go to different places to find out how, um, how these strategies uh, differ in terms of the regional variations. And I found two common uh, coping strategies uh, across different areas. Uh, in terms of definition, uh, I define coping strategy as widespread and adapted responses by ordinary citizens to manage, utilize, or overcome natural policy and institutional constraints and opportunities. Coping strategies are carried out for survivor as well as for profit accumulations. And it's very difficult sometimes to differentiate what's survivor and what's profit accumulation. However, the main motivation here is to improve current situation. So in my research, I do not consider alcoholism and suicide as coping strategy. Um, coping strategies can be both uh, legal uh, or illegal. Uh, they can be new uh, practices as well as uh, reformulations of old uh, practices. So the first uh, coping uh, common strategies I found among the these poorer segments of population is uh, frugal living. Uh, people live frugally in order to make efficient use of their space and labor. So want to give you an example of housing. It's not uncommon for three generations of one family or families of two, three siblings along with distant relatives and friends to be living under the same roof where they share the chores, responsibilities, and income. Uh, the picture on the left side is a picture of a middle income um, family, uh, which is not really the target, uh, the demography of uh, my focus. Uh, however, I want to show you even a middle income family uh, try to squeeze into as many um, people as they can in the household um, to uh, deal with these uh, economic challenges. The, uh, and this middle income also, they have 17 members in their family living in two bedrooms apartment. The other picture 
um, is uh, two brothers who earn living uh, making India bread on the street. And they told me that there are uh, 15 members in their family uh, living uh, in the house, which is about 21 square feet um, wide. Cutting down on the quantity and quality of food is also very common. Uh, there has been very well established market for products targeting low income populations. Uh, they're very cheap. They look really, you know, bright and uh, palatable, but they're v and they're very cheap. But they're most likely to be expire, low quality, and safe and regulated uh, products. And even if they are of high quality, they are most likely to be divided up into smaller packages uh, to make them affordable to the poor. Parents reduce expense for the kids' education. So kids will be taken out of school, uh, sent out to work as domestic workers, uh, factory workers, waiters in the cities. So if you're the oldest child in your family from very poor household of village, chances are that you will barely finish uh, third or fourth grade and you'll be sent out to the city to be an employ. And this is supported by the UN um, uh, Human uh, Development Index, which shows that the average schooling uh, years completed by average um, Burmese citizen is four years. There will be limited resources to spend on basic health care as well. Uh, the majority of people who cannot afford to see the doctor usually consult with salesperson at any drugstore, and most of them are unlicensed, or uh, at a convenience store which sells snacks and uh, Western and traditional medicine for various kinds of illness. Conservation is another coping strategy. Uh, people use and reuse, recycle their household goods until they can no longer be used. And this is a picture of a, a guy who earned a living by uh, collecting used materials in uh, different neighborhoods and um, sell those for, a, uh, with, for higher profits. The second most common strategies that I have found in the country is um, extra income generating activities. And these include uh, backyard garden, uh, livestock, breeding, home-based activities, and um, extra services um, provided uh, to, um, to uh, provided by self-employed as well as uh, civil servants. So people grow seasonal vegetables and engage in small-scale uh, livestock breeding. And naturally, this option is available only in villages and in suburbs where some open space is available. Switching to better alternative crops is another strategy. Um, many farmers uh, try better, uh, more profitable crops. And one highly profitable but not legal uh, crop is poppy or opium. And the latest report by the UN Office on Drug and Crime show that the acres devoted to opium production has increased, especially in the mountainous, the cooler areas over the past five years. And um, the study found that the growth in opium cultivation is said to be correlated with deterioration of food security in almost uh, all the regions. Many stay-at-home moms set up home-based income-generating activities, um, grocery, they set up grocery shops, uh, sewing or hair salon, weaving. Um, and here, home-based uh, shops have many advantages. They allow individual flexibilities as owners can open their shop at their own convenience and they can engage in multitasking by taking uh, care of children and doing household chores. Other provide, others provide extra service uh, at the same job site where they have been employed or work two or three jobs. A 16-year-old waiter told me that he earns extra income from the restaurant uh, whenever he was able to hook up the customers with girls who sing at uh, karaoke. Uh, sometimes he said um, he asks more money when the customers are drunk. Another waiter said that he collected used bottles from the shop and sold them back for recycling. A lady who works during daytime 
as massager, uh, transform herself into prostitute at night. Uh, fish, fish sellers, uh, usually uh, young, uh, single female, uh, sleep with their wholesalers uh, to get low interest uh, credit. Uh, poorly paid civil servants and government employees also attempt to supplement their income by charging fees for the services that are supposed to be provided free of charge, uh, such as when processing national identity or passport uh, applications, uh, issuing building permits, uh, granting vehicle license and inspection certificates, so on. Uh, teachers provide additional uh, tutoring to students. Um, most of these jobs uh, are not, most of these income generating activities are not uncommon in many third world countries. But some of the uh, activities, um, some of the jobs that people created in order to earn extra uh, money uh, can be beyond the imagination of a person who grew up in uh, industrialized uh, Western societies. I can give you one example here. Uh, the Burmese people consider white elephant to be um, uh, bringing good omen, uh, prosperity to the country. So whenever the Burmese government uh, capture um, white elephants, they put it in a different locations uh, for the public display. And um, when I visited the place, um, I noticed that the white elephant, um, the, t the tail hair of the white elephants are all missing. And so I asked the staff, what happened to the tail, you know, hair of the white elephants? And they said, oh, uh, all the staff plucked them and sold them in the market. Um, this, is, this is how they earned the extra money. Uh, what they did is they make them into rings, uh, uh, suckle them and make them, weave them into ring and um, sold them. And people who wear them uh, keep these as a, a good um, uh, charm um, for themselves. So this is how they make money. And so he was thinking and I was looking for the, 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 the tail hair of the elephant. So he said that even though we don't have this right now, we have elephant waste. Would you like to have elephant waste, a white elephant waste? And so I said, what do I do with white elephant waste? And he said, take the white elephant waste to your home and dig a hole in your front. Uh, the front of your home and the back of the home and bury these ways and you will be protected from all the evils so <laughs> so this is this is how employees uh, staff at the you know El elephant zoo uh, earn a living um, so, um, selling of the poverty uh, uh, pawning their possessions is also a common way, and borrowing, usually among the poor people, uh, is a very common way, uh, uh, coping strategies. And most of them, especially the poor people, and this has also happened uh, in almost all, all the third world countries, they have to borrow with a high interest rate because they don't have collaterals. And um, my research found that many of the, the collateral that they use um, is usually household items, uh, blankets, uh, mosquito nets, and pots and pans. Uh, a few, uh, I have come across uh, some people who are able to do a safe, um, and these uh, through rotating, um, rotating credit association, uh, through the patron and through the bank. However, most of these people are those who have regular incomes, uh, such as uh, daily wagers. Rent seekings. Uh, rent seeking, um, I consider rest, rent seeking activities as those do not provide, uh, pro produce any new goods or products. And uh, the rent seeking activities are the uh, result of two main um, um, circumstances. The first type of rent seeking um, emerged uh, either because of the official over regulations, uh, which forces citizens to uh, and consumers to pay off state employees to reduce excessive bureaucracies. And I can give you one example here. Um, 
at the Yangon University. And this is a, just a small example. We can think of so many uh, examples. Uh, but at the Yangon University, until very recently, when you go to, if you want to enter the campus, you have to wear the traditional clothing. Um, you will be turned away turned if you are not wearing traditional clothing. So if you wear uh, pants and skirts, you couldn't get into the campus. And what the employees, the gatekeepers at the university campus did is that they have extra traditional clothing for rent. So if you go there and you don't have, you're not wearing appropriate dress, then these people start renting you the traditional dress for 300 jats. So that's a sample of uh, one type of rent seeking sought by uh, civil servants, uh, government employees. The other types of um, rent seeking uh, emerge from individuals attempts to take advantage of the gap between official and market prices on certain goods and services. Uh, this is partly due to scarcity of goods, which is also due partly to official restrictions on imports and the government's attempt to impose artificially uh, low price on these scarce uh, goods. So individuals try to have access to these scarce goods and uh, with the artificial try to have it with the artificially imposed low prices and sell it in the uh, black market or in the market with the higher prices. And these activities is, was widespread during the socialist uh, period um, in 1970s, 1980s. Um, but it's still, we still have these activity, especially in markets where the government tried to uh, regulate heavily. Uh, example include um, petroleum market, uh, car market until 2011, uh, government airlines and train tickets, and even access to free service provided by uh, non-government organizations. So there are some brokers at the free clinics um, who will be lining up uh, to get the co uh, coupon. Uh, for free medical uh, treatment, and they will be get try they will try to get these coupon and sell it back to the patients uh, with a price. So these are um, th this is another forms of rent seeking activities that um, this is a petrol market uh, that ordinary people try uh, to use in order to um, make ends meet. Intensification of resource extraction. Um, resources have increasingly become scarce due to growth in populations, uh, extraction in timbers and mineral resources by heavy machineries and commercial activities. Um, and under these circumstances, we see that uh, citizens use desperate and sustainable method to exploit the resources. And examples include fishing with chemical and explosive device to catch uh, fishes, uh, especially in prohibited seasons, uh, cutting down uh, trees to procure a bunch of orchids or medicinal plants, um, and um, burning off the whole forest in order to catch wild animal, over application of fertilizer and preservatives in uh, food to uh, process food. And the picture I have here is in uh, northern Chin State, and this place used to be barren and infertile. And uh, beginning in the, the past seven and eight years, uh, they were able to um, in, they they were able to introduce intensive uh, agricultural method in the area, and um, have seen abundant crops and vegetables uh, that can be sold in the market. Um, but one of the things they did is they overused the uh, chemical and um, fertilizers. And when I was there, the lady who served me these potatoes, very delicious potatoes and cabbage said, we use chemicals so much that even flies, when they rested on our tomatoes, die five seconds after they rested on our tomatoes. And I was eating the tomato that she <laughs> served to me. But luckily, I'm still alive. So uh, deceptive strategies. Uh, deception uh, ranges from um, n uh, 
some of those uh, non-intruding strategies that do not have serious negative consequences on immediate environment to white lies, uh, short selling, diluting products, uh, impersonation, to our rice dealing, human trafficking, robbery, swaddling. So I'm, my, I'm focusing more on the first three of them, which is more widespread, whereas uh, stealing, human trafficking, trafficking, those are, uh, those uh, happen, those are the strategies but that are used by a minority segments of the population. It's not really the widespread strategies used by the, uh, the poor populations in the country. Uh, to give you an example of some uh, white lies that doesn't really have um, uh, negative consequences on the environment, um, kids were taught at a young age to say any kinds of white lies to survive in highly competitive uh, markets. When I was uh, visiting the pagoda uh, in Yango, there were so many kids trying to approach me to sell uh, fish feet, uh, because the pagoda has a f have a fish breeding ground, so that uh, there were kids who were trying to sell fish, and there were about 20 and 30 of them asking me to buy fish feet from them. And I really, I want to buy fish feet from them, but there are so many of them, I don't know how, where to, from whom I should buy the fish feet. So there was a, a little girl, she looked like she's about 11 years old, and she screamed at me. She said, I have seen you before. And I said, really, you've seen me before? Yeah, you are. I know you. You are a Korean movie actress in the movie. So I bought the fish feed from her. <laughs> um, why, uh, housewives complain of meat and fish sellers uh, short selling their products. So in Burma, Usually, if you go to bazaar, if you um, if you go to the uh, market, the products that you bought usually and always weigh less than what you are told. So the the housewives always complain about meat and fish sellers short selling. Here are some of the picture of the fish sellers uh, short selling their products in the market. Uh, milk and other products have been diluted with water. That's very common, um, and mixed with some ingredients, uh, good quality rice mixed with broken and low quality rice. So this is another, this is the daily occurrence that all the housewife has to face. Uh, other use, um, a little strategies, uh, again, similar to uh, the strategies that do not really have a serious negative impact on the environment. Uh, for instance, a beggar who begged for money uh, during the weekday. I was able to interview one uh, beggar, and he told me that during the weekday, he would beg on the street, um, in the main street at the University Avenue, and he would be wearing a necklace uh, with a, uh, a pendant with a Buddha statue. Um, but in the week, uh, in the weekend, he would beg by the church, and he would change his pendant into a cross. So this is this is the latest stra uh, strategies that he used. Um, and there were so many uh, so many people trying to impersonate themselves as nuns and monks. Uh, begging on the streets, and in 2011, it became a widespread uh, concern among the populations, and the government, uh, the, one of the local newspaper reported that the government arrested um, 5,000 individuals who um, who impersonate themselves as nerm and monks and beg for food and money on the streets. Others deal in piecemeal. A goldsmith would take a small piece of gold from customers who would like to repair or size their jewelry. A dockyard workers or a truck conductor boy would steal a handful amount of rice from each of the rice bags they carry or transport. Astrology. Uh, Burmese uh, rely, uh, Burmese people commonly rely on fortune tellers, astrologers, and religious figures uh, to consult on a number of issues from naming their children uh, to buying illegal lotteries uh, to operating businesses to finding uh, suitable partners. 
And the the idea here is uh, that uh, to help them deal with the current problems and challenges, and also to help prevent prevent them prepare them for unfortunate uh, misfortunate uh, events. So usually, these experts um, would give uh, the people advice uh, and advise them to take particular actions in order to uh, overcome, to successfully deal with the problems. And this, in Burmese, it's called uh, yediachi. That means that the, the, the astrologers or religious figures would, would advise you to carry out certain activities to help deal with the problems. And people go through lengthy and cubism procedures to carry out the actions suggested by astrologists or by these experts. Uh, for instance, a friend of mine uh, told me that he was supposed to uh, leave the country um, uh, on a certain date, but he has to postpone it for another month because his astrologist told him that this is not appropriate day for him to leave. So I conducted, uh, uh, this is an astrologer, GIST, um, uh, working at a, at a pagoda. Um, I, so I conducted uh, an representative sample a survey to find out how many people um, practice, uh, consult with astrologists. And uh, this is only in Yangon, just to give some ideas. Um, uh, a man, 81, uh, responded. Uh, equally divided between male and female, 76% um, of the population is Buddhist, 22% Christians, and 3% Muslim. And according to this, I found out the majority of them, uh, both men and women, uh, consult with astrologists at least once a year. And um, some of them did not really exactly follow through the the, the suggestions uh, provided by the experts. Um, and most find the consultation helps solve some of their problems to some extent and temporarily. And um, even when they found out that the consultation, the suggestion did not really help them solve their problems, uh, they do not blame it on the experts. They blame it on their bad luck or the incompatibility between themselves and the experts. Uh, so I see these fortune tellers, monks, and professionals serving the role almost as psychiatrists in a country that has only a handful of uh, professionals who deal with mental and emotional stress. Because if you look at the amount that costs them uh, to uh, get the service, it's very cheap. It ranges from uh, 500 jats to 10,000. So 500 jats is uh, less than a dollar. So um, it's it's cheap, and uh, people really uh, frequently rely on this. Um, I can also tell you one example: uh, a businessman. Uh, how widespread is the practice? The reliance on uh, astrology. Uh, a businessman told me that when his wife found out that her business partner run away with the money. It's about $10,000. It's a lot of money. The first thing she went, she, she did not go to police or to the lawyer. She went to the astrologist first, and she consulted. And he told me that if you go after, if you approach lawyers and police, in the end, you're going to spend more money and you're not going to, you will not, you will never be able to recover your money. But where if you approach the astrologist, you spend only about 5,000 uh, jats, and which is about five, six dollars. And uh, eventually, this calmed them down uh, eventually. So for them, the first, you know, the first person that they would approach is um, um, the astrologist. Uh, religion, um, studies show that religion, Religions tend to play a major role in insecure and impoverished societies that do not have established state welfare uh, system. And uh, Burma is uh, not uh, Burma is not the exception in this case. And uh, religion play a big role in this. And um, there are various ways in which 
um, religion or religious institutions help people cope with their uh, daily activities. Um, I want to show you what the majority of the Burmese populations are Buddhist and the rest of them are uh, Christian, Muslim, Hindus. And I want to show you examples of uh, Chin State, Northern Chin State, um, which is uh, the majority of populations are uh, Christians. And Chin State is considered very, the, considered the most, the, the poorest state in the country. And it's in the most remotest part of the country. And you can see that people are extremely religious. Every household that you go um, at the front door of their house, they will have their name as well as their religious denomination. So this guy is um, Pak Nai Kat. And uh, the, above his name is said that um, Jesus Subway Asi, which means in Chin language, it means that Jesus is the Lord. And this is usually associated with Baptists. So if you're Baptist, you put that kind of sign along with your uh, religious denomination. And if you're Catholic, you have the cross in front of your house there. And um, if you go to streets and houses and clinics, they are all named in uh, Christian names, uh, such as Grace, Emmanuel. You have so many Emmanuel clinics or Emmanuel uh, store, uh, Eva, and uh, the life of water. These are newly established uh, churches. It's always crowded, and this is one of the newly established uh, churches led by Koreans. And you, you can see that because they're crowded, they have to have additional TV sets uh, for uh, uh, different rooms. There has been increasing popularity among these newly established churches, uh, many of which are attractive to a uh, poor segment of the populations due to their emphasis on emotional outlet through praying, um, personal testimony, singing, and dancing, uh, and also due to charismatic and preacher, charismatic preachers who make emotional appeals through the message on salvation that targets the poor people or that deal with current uh, socioeconomic situations. And uh, due to their relatively relaxed rules and regulations about marriage or sexual practices. And usually these church has better communications with grassroots populations. So there are three ways in which religion has been used as coping mechanism. First, uh, religious teachings uh, boost morale. Uh, amidst adverse economic situations. Uh, people meditate, pray, uh, visit pagodas or churches to perform marriage or join monk er, religious obligations, as well as a way to deal with emotional economic stresses. Second, it is used as a practical instrument to cope with one political and economic problems. For instance, Some enter Mong Kok a few days just to take a break from secular world to deal with personal and professional stresses, to overcome alcoholism, uh, to avoid military conscriptions, and to run away from crimes. Uh, and this is um, very, this is, um, I, to give you an example, this is during the, uh, until two years ago when Myanmar was under the military government and the government uh, occasionally cracked down on people who sell um, DVD, uh, which contain um, information released by the opposition uh, exile uh, groups or uh, who engage in foreign exchange um, market. Uh, these, are co these were considered illegal by the government. So whenever the government was about to crack down on these activities, most of them entered the monk hook. They became monks as a strategy. And usually for this type of petty crimes, the government uh, uh, pretty, uh, leave it alone. If people are, you know, enter the monk hook, then uh, they don't really um, take actions against them. They leave them alone. So a week later, they come back and continue their businesses. Uh, thirdly, religious institutions also provide shelter, assistance, and safety net. Uh, traditionally, Buddhist monastic education plays a role in promoting uh, 
uh, Burmese literacy and providing shelter and food in times of emergency crisis and have increasingly carried out social work in monastic education, orphanage, healthcare, and humanitarian assistance. And the same thing can be said of Christian uh, institutions. And finally, religion and religious institutions serve as a means to acquire individual power and economic interests. And there have been uh, quite a few scandals where religious authorities uh, accused of uh, using religious, um, using donation money and uh, grants uh, given by foreign donors to accumulate their personal wealth and to enhance their power and exercise control over the followers. Um, gambling um, is done by, um, gambling is very popular in the country and is done by, practiced by individuals regardless of their social and economic um, status. However, there seems to be a higher level of addition among the poorer segment of the populations, especially on illegal gambling, illegal lottery. There are two types of illegal lottery in Burma, and they both are based in Thailand. One is done twice a month, and this is based on Thai official lottery, and the other is done every day, and this is based on Thai stock market. So. The, the one that is based on stock market, Thai stock market comes out four or five times a day. And you will see that pe poor people are very addicted to these, uh, bu to buying this uh, illegal lottery uh, because it's the price is cheap and uh, they're hoping that they might be able to some uh, earn some of the additional income. But in the end, usually, uh, we I haven't heard anybody who become rich uh, because of, um, well, especially poor people who buy these uh, illegal lottery. Um, I have not heard in any of them becoming rich, but usually uh, this there is a, a big destruction in terms of the household uh, finance and in terms, uh, there were so many divorces and suicide uh, because of the negative uh, Consequence because mainly because of the the debt accumulated from uh, engaging in illegal um, lottery, and I got this one from one of the wholesalers. So I don't know whether this is accurate or not, but I would not be surprised because this is a, the wholesaler um, who sold the illegal lotteries, and you can see that people who make about this much ended up buying, spending the same amount of their, or more of their salary on uh, illegal lottery. So this, even though uh, illegal, uh, the buying of illegal lottery has been used as one of the coping mechanisms to deal with economic stresses in the end, it's ended up uh, causing more trouble in the society. So I'm going to try to wrap this up. Uh, Exit uh, migration is uh, another coping strategy. Uh, they migrate internally, externally. Uh, sometimes um, uh, it's the individual within the household migrate. Uh, other times the whole family would migrate. Um, uh, some of the the some of them are temporary. Others are seasonal and permanent. And most of the people who migrate usually and those who go to the city usually are employed in the factories, construction service, um, and some will go to mining and plantation. Political ways of coping. Um, use, this is uh, how individuals use strategies to deal with uh, local uh, authorities. And usually on many occasions, people basically uh, try to put up with the um, the government, local government officials, and try to accommodate their needs. And I can uh, give you a sample, especially uh, until recently, when um, before this uh, newly government uh, came to power. Uh, for instance, many residents in the country would join a pro-government party uh, as a way to avoid punishment or harassment or to extract benefit. So up to 2010 elections, membership in government parties are very useful. 
because membership of government parties and organizations carry certain privileges. A karaoke lady became member of government party to avoid harassment by police. People who watch soccer at tea shop at night and make loud noises would also join the government party as a way to preempt police arrest. Muslims uh, or people from remote areas who do not possess citizenship uh, card also join the pro-government uh, party or pro-government organization since uh, this um, membership card is, can be as good as a citizenship card when they travel on the plane or, or on bus, on, on a train, and when they apply for government. Uh, sometimes uh, they have to bribe and negotiate with authorities. Oftentimes they use uh, deceptive strategies. But uh, this, if and on very rare occasion, people would approach a variety of sources such as uh, media or local authorities, religious leaders or local government officials to complain and to engage in protests. And this form of strategy has become more widespread uh, as the political environment has opened. And last but not least, uh, social network is also um, one of the uh, coping strategies in the country. So this uh, social network is either through family, friends, uh, through the patron, through the community, and through local, national, and international organizations. So to summarize it, um, I want to say that these uh, coping strategies are not exhaustive. Um, some of the categories are overlap. Uh, for instance, um, in extra income generating and uh, rent seeking activities, they're overlap. And individuals may employ a variety of strategies simultaneously. And another uh, thing to take note is that some of the strategies are specific to particular income group and gender. For instance, home-based extra income uh, generating activities are usually carried out by women, mother. And uh, finally, they are not uniquely Myanmar because similar coping strategies are also found in other poor and even rich countries. So what, and again, these strategies are not also static. They are going to be um, uh, reformulated and readjusted based on the uh, new political and economic uh, environments. So I put, at the end, I put all these different strategies and I look at their short-term, long-term implications here. Um, so um, I want to summarize it this way. The first point to make is that some of these strategies, particularly productive and service-oriented strategies provide promote self-governance as individuals take initiatives in dealing with the problems and limitations they face in making their way in life. Some of these activities, particularly every, everyday forms of resistance that defy official policies, could also lead to political and economic reform, either through open and organized resistance or through increased coverage by local media, which had recently been allowed to a greater say to issues that are not considered a threat by the central government. However, a desperate attempt, attempt to save resources, cut down on spending, particularly on nutrition, health, education, uh, could undermine the productivity of the family, household, as well as the whole nation's economy. Other desperate attempts to survive also put strain on the environment. Some coping strategies that deal with economic stresses create more harms than solve individual problems. Addition to illegal lottery has become a widespread social phenomenon in the country. People become mired in debt, frequently pawn, sell their possessions because of it. Migration may solve family stresses, but it could also lead to physical abuse, breakup of families. Other activities that uh, lead to corruption and uh, bribery may also mine state uh, capacities. There has been a number of local international NGOs which attempt to address social and humanitarian po problems. M however, a few, many of them has done little to foster accountability, transparency, and the, 
they promote hierarchical culture and exclusive practices. So I would like to end my talk like this. Coping strategies adopted by poor people are many and diverse. They have both negative and positive consequences. They have short-term and long-term implications. So any policy that attempts to deal with poverty issue should take into consideration the roots and implications of these coping strategies to develop a more comprehensive and realistic approach that are sensitive to the needs of the populations. And thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.